Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here with Gordy Morse. The first episode of Cutting Edge Leadership brought to you by our good friends at Morse Corporate Advisors. Welcome, Gordy. Nice to be here. So tell us about your vision of uh, Cutting Edge Leadership. How do you see this show playing out? I I think it's an opportunity to do two things. Uh, Give entrepreneurs in this city an opportunity to tell their story. And number two, to engage in real lot real time discussions about leadership and, and then, the challenges etc now what's your take on leadership in uh, american business Are you seeing uh, an upswing or there a lot of good leaders out there or there's something to be I, I i think that there's i was telling my guests earlier that uh you could fill the library of congress you know with books and ideas and there's so many styles I want to focus on leadership in business mm-hmm. uh, because depending on the situation, um, the styles and roles could be different. But in business, I really I really want to focus on business. I don't want to bleed outside of business. Right. And in business, in your experience, are you seeing the younger generation kind of embracing this leadership roles or do you think there's some learning to be had? Um, I think – Experience is required. You know, each each of my guests today uh, has a lot of experience. Um, I think that there is a good younger generation coming up. Absolutely. And, um, you know, they're strong, they're smart, they're focused. Um, but you still need time, you know. It's hard to uh, kind of fast forward that. You need some kind of uh, scar tissue, some skin knees. Correct. Correct. So who'd you bring with you today? Okay. I have three uh, really good guests. I have Eric Holyfield, founder, managing partner of Hamilton Investment Council. Welcome, Eric. I have Linda Willis, CEO and president of CMA Consulting. Welcome, Linda. And I have Jim Green, president and CEO, TM Capital Corporation. And who do you want to kick it off with? I want to kick it off with Jim. All right, Jim, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. Tell us a little bit about uh, TM Capital. How are you serving folks? So uh, TM Capital is, uh, I would describe us as sort of the quintessential lower middle market specialty investment bank. Um, we're um, about 30 years old, actually. This is our 30th year. Uh, we were founded by five partners, three of whom are still my partners today. The other two actually died as partners at TM Capital. We're not a John Gresham novel. We didn't kill them. You can leave if you want to, but one of, I think, the hallmarks of our business is that we've actually never had a partner join us and subsequently leave for another, you know, another platform. Mm-hmm. Um, we're three offices, Atlanta, New York, and Boston. We don't think of any of those offices as, as a headquarters. Uh, 14 partners, about 40 professionals. And we focus on a reasonably broad swath of the economy, but we're specialized across five verticals. And I don't know if you want me to get into that level of detail, but yeah, uh, we, yeah, we do a lot of uh, a lot of sell side mergers and acquisitions work. Um, we are a bit different than several of our peers in that we do a fair amount of high level, what I would describe as private market finance work. Uh, a lot of firms that look like us do, you know, almost nothing but M and A work. Um, and we have a group of professionals, actually, one of whom is my younger brother, uh, who are some of the most, I think, experienced private market finance people really in America. And so we do more of that work than most firms that look like us. The verticals that we focus on are consumer, and we tend within consumer to do a lot of uh, branded food, um, uh, gift and home decor uh, branded apparel work. We do, uh, we do a lot of work in what we call business services. And really what business services encom- encompasses, uh, are, are a group of, um, what I would describe as mission critical, high value outsource services that businesses historically kind of kept, 
um, within their four walls, but which over the last 10 or 15 years um, have become candidates for outsource services. So, you know, things like maintaining all of the moving equipment in a warehouse. Walmart used to keep an army of, of uh, um, uh, maintenance people hanging around to do that work, and now there are independent businesses that do that work on a kind of an as-needed basis for Walmart. So business services, uh, consumer, healthcare services. Um, we have a practice that we call technology, but it's really I, uh, IT services focused mostly on, on the Oracle um, ecosystem. Um, and I'm leaving one out, uh, we, industrial. And within industrial, we do a lot of work in uh, paper, forest products, building products, um, metals and um, kind of high value manufacturing. So, Jim, l- let me ask you this. Um, that's a great overview of the firm. You've been there eighteen years. Tell tell us about like the journey of building the business and 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 how do you create a culture that attracts people that don't leave? Well, it, it, first of all, I didn't create the culture. Um, the culture really predates me, and, and I've, I've been CEO of the firm now for 11 or 12 years, and I've kind of viewed my role as um, as not getting in the way of something that's been working really well. Um, firm, as I said, was founded 30 years ago by my partners. Um, I actually am kind of the circle of life story because I started my career on Wall Street with their predecessor firm. I was in a regional office of a firm called Thompson McKinnon. Most of your audience probably isn't old enough to remember Thompson McKinnon. I remember it. But it was yeah. a great firm. Yeah, you, you probably do remember <laughs> yeah. it. Um, and, and in 1989, um, it, it was a leveraged ESOP owned business and coming out of the second stock market crash, um, it was, it was actually forced into a merger with Prudential. Ironically, I had started my career at Thompson McKinnon, and then the guy I was working for had moved our office to Prudential. So I was really excited because I thought, well, these guys who I'd worked with for a year and a half and really loved and who I'd stayed in touch with, all all of a sudden we were going to put the band back together, and that didn't happen. Lo and behold, those guys said, you know what, we're never working for another big firm again. And they went off and founded TM Capital. They actually acquired the investment bank from Thompson McKinnon. Um, And they really, you know, they set out from day one to create a, a model where client service and kind of relentless pursuit of what we call the extraordinary outcome was, you know, our only objective. Um, long before the idea of sort of a conflict-free model on Wall Street had any traction, they were talking about being conflict-free, really having, you know, kind of one dog in the hunt, you know, one horse in the race, that being so. Yeah. So tell me about, the um the le- how how the important decisions are made at your firm is yeah. it a is it a group is it a, is it how how do you manage the really important decisions is it you and the founding partners so how, you know, how we, does that work uh, you know as as i think is true for everyone in this room our, our business is a human capital business which means that the assets that mean, you know, when, when you're running a manufacturing business, the assets can't walk out the door at night. They're, you know, they're plants and equipment. Our assets are our people. And, and when, when you're running, when you're running, when you're part of a business where your only asset that really matters are your people, um, I, I, I don't think personally that top down, um, sort of dictatorial, management structures work at all. I think if you're not building consensus, you're sowing the seeds for discord and ultimately you'll wake up one day and the people who mean most to you and who mean most to the organization just won't be there anymore. And that's not an original thought. I mean, that really started with my partners. Now, when they started the firm, it was really just them. So they could get into a room and make all of the decisions that needed to be made. We really moved from that sort of you know pure partnership model to a more kind of traditional organizational structure, I guess it was 12 years ago, when we acquired a firm that basically doubled our size and we kind of woke up one day and said, we're too big to make every decision every day, you know, by sort of unanimous consent. But having taken the role as CEO, I've sort of described myself in in many contexts as, as a bit like 
the vice president's role in the Senate. He casts the deciding vote, or she, I guess, could be a she. Um, your vice president casts the deciding vote when there's a deadlock, but boy, you don't ever want to see that happen. If the VP is casting the deciding vote in the Senate, something's gone haywire. And that's really the way we manage day-to-day at TM Capital. Everything that we do is by consensus. People have you know, broad brush to make decisions on their own. And, you know, my my role is to sort of monitor the process and make sure that if we're getting outside of what we all have agreed are kind of the guardrails, that we sort of reset and get back into the guardrails or get back within the guardrails. That's a, that's a great description of a, of a very strong culture. Um, one one of the things that you have to be excellent at, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is um, if, if if you're attracting professionals that are staying with you, that means you're doing something really well in the selection process. You know, how do you, as as a leader of the business, how do you um, drive that? Like, what makes what what do you do differently um, in that process that you know, allows you to attract world class people to so the, with the you. right answer. Since, since I'm sitting across mm-hmm. from Lynn, is you rely on a really good placement person, <laughs> executive search person. <laughs> there you go, and 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 let her vet your candidates. But I think she would thank agree you for that, the plug. Yeah, I like. I think it. I think Linda would agree. There's a lot more to it mm-hmm. than that. And and actually, you hit on I think one of the areas where I, I, I view my role as most important because our partners and and. You know, even our non-partners, our rising stars, are too busy day to day to really put the time into um, into the, into team building, into into you know, sort of expanding our ranks that it requires. Um, you you can't be sort of in and out of the hiring process and be effective if you're not interviewing people constantly. Then you really don't have a basis for comparison from one candidate to the next. And so, one of the things that I do religiously is interview, meet personally with everyone who joins the firm. And that includes, you know, our entry-level administrative people. And I do that for two reasons. I do it, number one, because I frankly want to know who we're hiring and I want to make sure that I, you know, that I endorse whatever decisions we're making around hiring. But number two, because from the moment you meet somebody who's considering a new job, you're beginning to set, you know, kind of cultural parameters and I, I don't think there's a more effective way to set those parameters at TM Capital than to have somebody who's considering making their career decision or, or, or joining TM Capital sort of hear from me personally what I think is important about the firm. And it, it you know, if you kind of start with that, it eliminates a lot of potential misunderstanding as people it's, move forward. It's an extremely effective model. As we know, extremely effective. Uh, l- let me ask My you. My fear is we're getting too big. I may not be able to do it forever, but I think I'll just abdicate. Uh, it sounds. To, it's. Point. It sounds to me like uh, you got a really cool place. Uh, it sounds like a meritocracy. Is is that a fair description? Well, yeah. I mean, you can't look in 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 our business. I see again, Linda nodding, and I suspect Eric. He'd say the same. I mean, you know, it's it's about you know who's putting runs on the scoreboard. I mean, if you know. Yes. Yes. If, if you're trying to reward everybody, then you're rewarding nobody. Yes. Um, it's a very competitive business. Um, you know, people are, uh, you know, people are working hard every day to excel and to be outstanding. But it, again, you, you can, you can let that competitiveness devolve into something that we think is extraordinarily unproductive in our industry, which is what we call sort of the eat what you kill model. Businesses like ours often, devolve into really collections of independent contractors who are kind of carrying a common business card. And what you lose when you get to that point is any sense of collaboration among your professionals. And ultimately that's to the, to the real detriment of your clients and your performance as advisors. So we walk a fine line. You, you, right? I was going to say you do walk a fine line. Um, and it's, it's hard to do, but, there are many cultures of smaller firms. I think the smaller firms, and I know you're worried about getting too big, but the smaller firms are able to operate in a way that 
allows you to attract and keep and develop the best. And the fact that you take a personal interest in the hiring of anyone, that sends a powerful message about culture and about how much you care, you know? So, so how do you, how do you make sure that everybody's incentives are aligned? Um, well, I guess a couple of things. First of all, um, at the partner level, we have, uh, 14 partners. Our compensation structure, I think is unique in our industry. We, we do it, um, on a completely transparent basis. So at the end of the year, we know what the bonus pool is that's available to the partners because we've paid everybody else. And at that point, every partner has to make a recommendation as to how that bonus pool is going to be divided partner by partner. If you just ask each partner for a self-recommendation and then you add them up, you know, it'll be twice the pool, right? So that doesn't work very well. And what we do is we basically make every partner say, if you were in my shoes, here's how, you know, if, if, if I were in your shoes, Jim, here's how I would divide the pool and why. So I get 14 very, very granular, very, very thoughtful, in most cases, recommendations. Um, you get to know over time, you know, who tends to sort of overstate, you know, his or her own um, contributions relative to others. And then all of that gets synthesized over, you know, kind of a several day period. My, my wife Lauren would say, those are the blackest days in our house because I basically go underground for three or four days to do it into a recommendation firm wide. And one of the things I'm proudest of in my 12 years is that, uh, and this will be the 13th year, I believe that, that I've been responsible for ultimately making that compensation recommendation. And the longest conversation we've ever had before we've approved it was about five minutes. So it works. I, I I love the angle that that you ask someone to um give you input on everyone else's comp. That is so cool. Well, one of the because luxuries, Wall Street, yeah. as you know, right. typically never went that far. It was typically okay. What do you think you should be paid? Right. You know, the fact that you actually make everyone think about how everyone else should be paid, and they know what the pool is. That's a very interesting dynamic. It, it creates a self-limiting dynamic, but we're also very fortunate because we we collaborate to a degree and we communicate to a degree that gives every partner, I think, a very um, a very accurate kind of view on what his or her partners are doing, and 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 they the feel year. a part of the firm. They feel well, a part yeah. of the firm. I have one one last question, and then we'll we'll move on to Linda. Um, this is a little bit different, but who are two, just two individuals, uh, whether past or present that you really admire from a business leadership perspective? And what, what do you like incorporate from them? Uh, if, 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 if you incorporate? Well, certainly, I, you know, unequivocally, um, the person in this world who I'm not related to, who I admire most, is Bernie Marcus, um, and I've been profoundly blessed um, to to have a role in Bernie's philanthropy now for over 20 years, and so I've watched him as he's really um, redefined, in many respects, how how philanthropy gets done in this country. Um, I, I I really I knew Bernie well, but I never saw him in the trenches at Home Depot, but I don't think his leadership style has changed at all. Um, he's extraordinarily smart, but he is also an extraordinarily, um, he's a, he's an extraordinarily good listener. Sometimes I've described him as an aggressive listener. He sometimes is taking issue with you as he's listening mm -hmm. to you. And if you don't know him well, you can think he's basically rejecting what you're saying, but he listens extraordinarily well. He's open-minded to ideas from people who've earned his trust. And, you know, I go to work every day wanting to emulate that, and I encourage my partners to emulate that. I mean, nobody, you know, no, nobody in any context has a monopoly on good ideas. And anybody who thinks they do is out to lunch. If you're surrounded by really smart people, then you got to be learning every day. And Bernie would tell you at 91 years old, 
He wakes up every morning looking forward to learning something new from somebody who he, who he trusts, or it may not even be somebody he trusts. So listening is, is something I think I've learned, you know, observing him over 21 years. Um, That's fair. And, and, and being a lifelong learner. Uh, I mean, being a lifelong learner. Yeah. As I said, he's 90, 90, it's incredible. I said 91, I aged it's him. Incredible. He's 90 years old and he'll never stop learning. And what he's done for Atlanta, you can't even quantify. It's, it's just incredible with, with, uh, the aquarium and, and the different, uh, healthcare medical facilities. I mean, the guy is, the guy's a giant. He's a giant. You're very fortunate to have to have that relationship, and and the people at TM Capital are fortunate that you're trying to emulate his leadership. Sounds and, and, sounds know, like you, a fun you know, place you know, to be. You asked me for one more, and I would I would I would actually I'm going to stay on the Home Depot line. I think Frank Blake um, is an absolutely extraordinary leader. Very different style than Bernie. Stepped into a set of circumstances Tough. that Tough. were absolutely a recipe for failure. Um, and, and if you looked at Frank's resume when he stepped into the CEO's role at Home Depot, it wasn't sort of the classic CEO in waiting's resume. And yet he, he righted the ship and he earned the trust of the organization and he moved that company forward in a way that has really been extraordinary. And, and, you know, for Atlanta has been, um, you know, uh, really, you know, beneficial beyond our ability to quantify it yeah and he's kind of a below the radar guy and he did he saved home depot he he brought home depot back from 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 the edge you know restore and he restored the the culture and then he accelerated it i agree incredible leader incredible leader jim thank you that was that was that was awesome i appreciate you coming now i have Linda Willis, CEO and President of CMA Consulting. It is nice to have you here, Linda. Thank you for having me. Linda, you got a really interesting story. Could you please tell people your background and how you uh, started your firm and what the focus of your firm is? Because you have a great story. I appreciate that. Thank you. So my background is securities litigator. Um, Started uh, with a Wall Street firm, uh, first private practice, then a Wall Street firm. And was in, um, then moved into business side of, uh, wealth management and then into senior leadership. So sales, field management, senior executive leadership. Um, having done all of that, I started my own RIA and ultimately decided to take all that information that I had and parlay that into more of a consulting, uh, consulting role. So I started CMA consulting three years ago. So unlike 30 years of your firm, Jim, uh, mine's only three years old, but like you, we have offices in Atlanta, New York, and Boston. And we do basically two things, hyper-focused on financial services industry. We do search, executive search and placement for financial services professionals and businesses. And we also work with Registered investment advisory firms on mergers and acquisition advisory. So registered investment advisory firm wants to make an acquisition or sell their business. We go out and help them find the right partner to do that. How much of that activity are you seeing right now? Because that's a big universe. Tell, Tell us about what's going on in that universe right now. So there's a lot of activity moving away from the larger uh, wirehouse type firms like the Merrill Lynch's, Morgan Stanley's, UBS's of the world, much to Jim's earlier point with respect to businesses that are very heavy human capital laden and the fact that having a very dictatorial type of approach to managing people oftentimes doesn't play well in that space, a number of those financial advisors are getting fed up with that and being treated like chattel and are moving to the independent space. So becoming their own registered investment advisory firms, much like Hamilton Investment Council. Um, Because of that movement, you're seeing a lot of people shifting away and you're seeing much smaller firms, but it's all a cycle. So you're also seeing those some of the smaller registered investment advisory firms merging together, looking for acquisitions to be able to grow so that they can get more scale. Um, the interesting thing about the market is more private equity is moving into the space. And consequently, that's that's creating a lot more buyers in the market than there are sellers. Even though it's a very aging population with respect to financial advisors today, less younger generation people moving into the space, you still have a number of people who are trying to increase their valuation 
uh, by by acquiring or merging before they sell. So you're seeing more buyers, less sellers. Interesting. And how how do you how do you identify opportunity in 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 your world? How do you kind of figure out where where to go looking for for clients and and for opportunity to to maybe advise in you know an M and A activity in an M and A function. So um, oftentimes it is it is truly word of mouth referral. Um, I get a number of reach outs directly to me from former colleagues or um, from referral sources from former colleagues. I also um, do some speaking engagements in the. Uh, in the financial services space, which generates a number of, of opportunities that come to us. Um, and frankly, I, I call on people. I cold call them. Uh, I want to, I want to ask you about, um, y- you have a, you have a very unique background. Linda's actually had some very serious leadership roles in her life. Um, and I think back to, uh, the job you did at UBS. It was incredible. Linda, Linda took over a business that was, uh, suffering and in a relatively short period of time built it into something really special. Um, they were lucky to have her. Talk about being a, a woman leader in financial services, the challenges that it presented to you and uh, the opportunities it presented to you. Well, it's the reason that I moved from being a lawyer to being a, um, a business executive within financial services because there were so few women on Wall Street and there was a real need for, there are lots of women on Wall Street. It's just they weren't the people who were sitting in the corner offices. They were people who were sitting outside of the corner office. And so consequently, there was a real push when I had the opportunity to move over and work uh, in management first and then ultimately at the senior levels. It's a, it's a male dominated industry and it's a, um, and so it is fraught with its own challenges. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm grateful for opportunities that I received because I was a woman and they needed women at the table, but always wanted to be, to, to keep my seat at the table based on my talents and my contributions. That's excellent. That's excellent. Let's, let's talk about your, your leadership style, your philosophy. What, what is at the center of your your philosophy and style? And could you describe it to us? I'm sort of a believer um, in the Ronald Reagan sort of philosophy, which is essentially surround yourself with really good, smart, talented people and allow them to do their job. Um, have always felt like I was gifted with um, opportunities early in my career to take on um, – to take risks, to take on challenges that I might not have really had the experience to, um, to accept, but took those risks. And so I try to give other people the same types of opportunities to not only succeed, but also to fail and fail gracefully and, and provide good guidance, feedback and, um, and counsel with respect to how to make changes going forward. That's why I did such a great job. Uh, Linda also did an amazing job at Bear Stearns, by the way. Very she kind. was, she was incredible. Um, let, let, let's talk about your business right now. What, what, tell me about the nature of the relationships that you develop in your business and, and what you, what you offer them when, when you, when you first talk to them and how you get them to engage with you. Wow, that's really broad. <laughs> but I would say it's, um, in many ways, it's like dating. <laughs> so it's it's about getting to know an individual, um, garnering their trust, understanding what their challenges are, as well as what their strengths are, and where there might be an opportunity for for growth, for enhancement, um, and and then helping them see. So, for instance, a financial advisor from Merrill Lynch looks at him or herself as being a entrepreneur and a business operator. You know, the reality is most people who sit in that chair 
are great practice managers, but there's a difference between being a practice manager and being able to give good investment advice to clients, to go out and do business development, and to be able to run a business, understand a P&L, understand compliance, supervision, all the things that go into the day-to-day operations of an actual business structure. So Eric is someone who has those capabilities and skill set as well as being a great financial advisor, but not everybody does. So what I try to do is help people understand what's their EQ, their IQ, and where they are in their career cycle, what their growth or or not growth objectives are. Are they looking to really coast now? Are they looking to exit in a short period of time? And what's going to be the right fit for them and their clients and their business? So how are you kind of coming up with that assessment? Well, uh, probably... 30 years in the business of so having... How, like, how quickly can you... Is this something you just look at their resume or you talk to them for 20 minutes and you kind of have a good feel of this? A lot of it has to do with um, the conversation. It's the questions that you ask and getting to know the person, again, garnering their trust. It's like dating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it all happens in a short period of time? It does. And then you can feel if it's a good cultural fit for the individual and if there's an opportunity for them? The... Yes. I mean, that does take a little more time. I mean, I think that the, uh, anytime you have a placement, especially with an advisor who's taking their business and their clients and you're trying to integrate that into another culture, another firm or merging two firms together, right. it, it, it's very much like a marriage. So you have to ensure that always it starts with people meeting each other and do they like each other? Do they feel like this is the right fit? Forget whether the clients are a good fit. Forget what the business model is, whether the platform right. fits forget their Forget the need. math part, but the It's, it's the all human about chemistry. Part, right. right. The human part. Is, exactly. And that's where you spend a lot of your time? I spend a lot of time on that, yes. And then mm-hmm. you, but you have to start too with, it's sort of a two-handed. So on one hand, it does have to do with the chemistry and the interpersonal connectivity. But the, on the other hand, you also have to understand, and I think that's what makes what I do um, what makes me unique in this business. So unlike a recruiter in this, in the field, a lot of them have never sat in the seat. They mm-hmm. don't, they've never lived it. They've never breathed it. And so consequently, they can't really assess it the same way. And having been both as a lawyer on the operational side of the business in a leadership role and actually been out in the field doing the job of a financial advisor, I have a unique set of skills to be able to dissect a business and understand whether or not a platform And all of the components are available in a certain business to really support what that financial advisor is trying to achieve. It's called heavyweight experience is what it, I mean, it really is. I mean, the the fact that Linda has seen uh, so many different parts of the life cycle of being a financial advisor, having uh, managed through the credit crisis, having managed through the European debt crisis, having managed through the tech meltdown, she's got uh, a very good handle and, and, and can pretty much surmise quickly, you know, what it is that is important about the person that she's, you know, talking to. So that's the special sauce as far as I'm concerned. I appreciate it. Uh, let me, let me ask you this and then we'll move on to Eric. Um, could you give two examples? Of leaders, either living or, or not, that um, that you admire and that you've integrated into your leadership style. I don't know if anyone would say I've done a great job integrating mm-hmm. it into my leadership style, but I think I mentioned earlier Ronald Reagan. I also really um, admire Oprah Winfrey. I admire her both as a business professional and somebody who's forged a path in an industry where. You know, not only is she a woman, but she's a woman of color and, um, and she's built a number of verticals around her, her basic skill set and she's built a brand around herself and she's made a lot of careers and she's been very philanthropic along the way. So I really admire what she does. I'm not sure I've done a great job of integrating that into my own style, but if I could, that's who I'd be most like. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's understandable. She's an incredible woman and what she's done is, uh, very, it's, it's breathtaking, actually. It's so, it, m- it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I admire Oprah too. Definitely. Linda, thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to, uh, my man, Eric Holyfield, uh, founder and managing partner of the Hamilton Investment Council. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Tell us about the Hamilton Investment Council and, uh, your organization 
and what what you focus on uh, as an organization. Mm -hmm. So I've been in the business uh, almost 21 years now. Um, I picked the perfect time to move from the warehouse of Merrill Lynch and start uh, our own firm. Perfect year of 2008. Um, Ooh. Ooh. So, uh, During a hurricane, uh, Category 5 hurricane. So Hamilton's really been around since 2008, but the ownership of the RIA wasn't until 2016. And I was looking to start something different. I've always been told on Wall Street you can't reinvent the wheel, and I've kind of lived by that rule. But I think there's some things that we could reinvent. And we wanted to have a firm that was um, a boutique wealth management firm but also had access to some of the same services, products, trading desks that the big firms have. So we do have an RIA, but we're also a hybrid. So half the firm still has their broker-dealer license. Uh, we clear back through a broker-dealer, LPL. We also are multi-custodial with uh, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, and we can be with whoever we want to. The unique thing about us, we also have access to some of the big warehouse trading desk, and that was what's important with me. My background is bonds. I've traded corporate bonds pretty much my whole life, and going to an RIA and being with um, the, the electronic firms is kind of scary. Where are you going to get your inventory? How are you going to get pricing on bonds? But what we've created is relationships where we can go to Citigroup, we can go to J.P. Morgan, and we even do some lending stuff with Goldman Sachs and bring that all in-house. So now we're not captive like – I was at Merrill Lynch. We really have the ability to, I'm not going to say go all over Wall Street, but we have the resources there to get what we need in a, in a boutique uh, firm. I, I think it's incredible. I, I remember a time on Wall Street where the, the, the independent advisor couldn't compete with the wirehouses. It's flipped now. Mm -hmm. The, the independence, the, uh, the access to technology and to information and to, and to having a, that's, that's, that's very, very powerful. And, uh, I think it lends itself to growth because I think the warehouses, you know, could end up dying in the next 10 years. They're very old. Well, I think the model started when, um, Smith Barney sold to Morgan Stanley. So now Citigroup didn't have 16,000 advisors to push the product to. So they created an RIA desk that services people like us a lot nice. of people just don't realize it's there so we have complete access to it uh their bankers um their trading desk whatever we need um the name hamilton investment council mm -hmm. what's what's behind the name mm -hmm. for the most part i'm from hamilton mill uh oh, north of georgia <laughs> all right that's sort of where it started but uh, it's a playoff maybe a founding father out there that created the financial system in our country <laughs> very cool um I, I have noticed one thing about your firm that I think is really cool. Um, you don't see a lot of young people coming in the business mm -hmm. today. It's very hard for them to make it. Yet you've brought in two millennials, mm -hmm. and you have them really up and going. Tell, tell us about that. How did you? How were you able to accomplish that? I've always believed in training people, um, smart people that. Uh, uh, have a lot of drive that believe in the vision and the culture. Um, if, if you keep the right ones in place, they'll be there for a long time. And I look for niche people to bring into Hamilton. And the two you're talking about, specializing retirement plans, cash balance plans, it's a very specific market, and it's all customized. And, uh, yeah, they're doing a great job. So I think it's just finding that right fit, the right individual that will buy into the vision and culture of what we're trying to do. How, how do you um – differentiate yourself in the market it's it's a it's a big space um and it's growing mm -hmm. it's growing because of migration from the wirehouses it's real and it seems to be picking up steam um how do you differentiate yourself in 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 your world how do you uh you know compare and contrast yourself mm -hmm. to a lot of the other rias that are out there I think a lot of RAs and a lot of firms are institutionalizing themselves. And they're trying to put products or po uh, processes in place that make their life easier. Um, there's a lot of complex structured products out there, mutual funds, uh, different types of investments that they use to not have to manage the money. The way we differentiate ourselves is we wanted to take the complexity 
of the products out there away and bring it back down to just stocks and bonds. And that's all we do. Um, maybe a few mutual funds here and there, but it's really just stocks and bonds. And we manage that in-house. We have uh, our own portfolios we manage, and then we trade our own bonds uh, in-house too. That's a little different. A lot of RAs don't do that. They're outsourcing the management. Yeah, It's more cookie cutter. It's more cookie cutter. We try to customize it. So we're trying to be a more client-centered, um, uh, objective data, um, processes that we can put in place that we can customize uh, a a portfolio or a plan for the clients that come in is just not a cookie cutter. It's not like filling out a 10 question uh, risk tolerance and say you go into portfolio B2. That's not what we're doing. We're really trying to customize uh, something for the individual, make it a little more high touch. And what would you ultimately like to accomplish with uh, the Hamilton Investment Council in the next, let's say, five to 10 years? Do you have that figured out or do you have that vision? In, in 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 your head i think the market's changing i think there's a lot of momentum going towards uh, private equity investments uh, higher net worth individuals are trying to buy into properties and investments uh, if you look at the tax codes that are out there now with opportunity zones it's huge and that's kind of what we're trying to do is build a more complete firm that can advise help raise money or advise on someone trying to put money into those opportunity zones or businesses, whatever it may be. And, um, yeah, I think investments, stocks and bonds are just a part of what the firm of the future is going to look like. And a lot of RAs don't take advantage of that. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, describe your leadership style, your leadership philosophy. I think when you look at leadership, you have to have a vision. And you have to have people that believe in you and buy into that vision or it doesn't work. Um, I try to put myself in other people's shoes. And a lot of times I will look for someone that I find credible that has completely different views from me. And I try to put myself in their shoes and try to manage that way. Um, I, I think I'm a very good listener. Um, and then I think another part is you got to be available. I mean, when I was at Merrill and, even at Stern AG, if a manager wasn't available, you get frustrated very, very quickly. So I try to be available. But the other, I think it's just listening and putting yourself in other people's shoes, being very confident, establishing that vision and the culture of your firm and you know getting people to buy into it. How have you dealt with the challenge of hiring millennials? Because they, they are, you know, I'm, I have three millennial daughters. I adore them. You know, we all have, um, and, and I think they're an incredible generation. However, they are, they are somewhat different. How do you, how are you able to, um, how, how do you meet that challenge? Right. And speak specifically, you have two working with you. How, what did they do to stand out? A lot of times it's just your gut feeling when you're interviewing them. You just ask the right questions and see how they answer it. Um, these two are just really smart, and they've got industry experience uh, from college. Uh, they did some work um, in our industry. But was uh, there something that happened, or they said something, or they showed you something that you're like, okay, this is the one? It's, it's really their industry experience, what they had access to. Um, it's like when I came into the industry, they're like, how are you going to get clients? Do you have money? Do your parents have money? <laughs> so you know, they already had access to books of business that they can network and mm -hmm. i think that was part of it that's interesting that's interesting um how do you make decisions in your firm is it a, is it a collaborative process mm -hmm. um like like jim and is executes at at tm capital mm -hmm. is it a similar process so i have two other partners um complex decisions that we need to make obviously we will talk about that um on a daily basis I'm a big believer, and you make decisions, and you go on. And I don't look back. Um, I make them pretty quickly. And how long have your partners uh, been with you? How, lo how long is that relationship? We all started at Merrill at a very similar time, probably within six months of each other. Uh, one partner that I have, uh, we've been um, we've had a book of business together for pretty much 20 years. Um, the third partner we've known for that long, but uh, never shared a book of business. And 
uh, do you have all very complementary skill sets? Is what 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 brought what brought the three of you together? The time at Merrill Lynch, they were I trying see. to build teams. I see, and I see. Uh, that was. A, and you're like, we'd make a great team, just not here, <laughs> right? Well, you know, they always felt that if one person on the, one person on the team left, they keep the assets with the other one. Right, right, right. And what didn't happen with us, but right. um, yeah, that's kind of where it started. That's, that's we do cool. have complementary skill sets, though. For that's sure. cool. That's very cool. Um, tell tell me about uh, a number of people that you admire mm-hmm. as leaders, living, yeah. not living. Uh, you know, what do you admire about them? What are you trying to incorporate into your style? I kind of look at things differently. It's not just individuals; it's um, teams or processes. I'm a big sports guy. Um, that's part of our business is uh, managing money for professional athletes. So I look at um, dynasty teams out there, teams that are you know, have dominated for years, what makes them successful, what makes them win year in and year out. And I know people probably laugh at this, but t- take Alabama, take the New England Patriots, uh, the San Francisco Giants when they went on their run, where they took, you know, maybe not first-round picks, third- and fourth-round picks and did a lot with them. That's what inspires me is learning those processes. I really uh, I like to study the mind. I think the mind's very, very powerful. And if you put it to the right use, there's probably not much you can't accomplish. Um, I like reading about our military and their thought processes. And so it's not an individual. It's more of a teams. And Well, speaking of military and their thought process, it's very interesting. Um, I wrote down the 10 qualities of leadership in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to, like, throw them out and maybe get your reaction of, like, you know, spontaneous reaction of, yeah, that's on, off, et cetera. Let me, let me just throw them out. Uh, the first is justice. It's a t- that's, that's an interesting one. Second, judgment. Critical, critical. Um, third, dependability. Mm-hmm. Sounds like, Jim, you're incredibly dependable, that your people know that you're there. Same with you. That, there's no boundaries there that that if they need you, they can get you. That's that creates loyalty. Um, integrity. That's so important. Uh, decisiveness, you know, because you, you hate to see people like analyze, you know, forever. I bet you all three of you. Well, I know you're decisive, uh, but I, I it, do you consider yourself a decisive leader? Once you make a decision, uh, you just go or I, yes, but um, but I'm careful to pick my spots. I you, see. You've you, you've got to you know you've got to save those moments at least in in our culture where I've got 14 very high powered partners who all have lots of ideas. Um, you know, for moments when you really feel like it's absolutely mission critical that the decision be made now how do you balance that decisiveness with course correcting if the decision turns out to be a miss that's you know i think that's where uh, the, the scale of our business and the fact that we're 14 partners and we can communicate as a group whenever we want to um really works to our benefit you know it's it's much much harder to move a ship Right. If if it's a giant ship and, you know, you're you're having to rely on teams throughout the ship to kind of, you know, get get things on a different course. If 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 we have an issue that that really requires um, discussion amongst the group of us, we can you know, we can gather a group within an hour. So I think it's availability and 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 I think it's the fact that everybody's completely bought into what we're trying to do. So, you know. If if we say we need to talk about something, people will make the time, and and um, you know and and um, commit themselves to working through it with us. Decisiveness seems to be even more important on the downside. Uh, so if you've made a poor decision, being decisive in correcting that decision and taking another direction, that's even more important than the being decisive in the first decision, in my mind. So taking action. Maybe is better than being decisive <laughs> is well, taking action than making the decision, but being kind of vulnerable enough to say, "Hey, this isn't working." Then we got to change course. A bit. You miss a hundred percent of the shots mm-hmm. you don't take. Put on net. You have to take. You have to take shots. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to take shots to grow and to learn. 
Um, no doubt. I think your partners and employees have to believe in your decision making that when you do make a decision that you're making the right one, but you also got to take responsibility when you don't make the right one immediately own up to it. Yeah. That's, that's what I was going to say. Um, do any of you have an issue saying to the people, uh, we met, I messed up. I'm, I'm correcting it. And here's what I've learned from it. Do you, do you ever do that or no? <laughs> yes, exactly. But sometimes those are, you, sometimes you look for opportunities to do that. I understand I, what I you're saying. It, I think it brings, it brings balance in the, in, in the eyes of the people around you. If you're, you know, if you're capable of being self-critical and if, if people feel like you're self-aware, yes, um, I think they, they they tend to have more confidence in in you in those moments when you say, "Okay, this is what we need to do. Yeah. Let's just move forward." And it encourages your team to be more forthright uh, with respect to their own decision making, such that if they make a mistake, to own up to that. You know, come in, just lay it on the line, fall on the sword, and we'll figure it out. And we'll move on. <laughs> we'll solve it. But the worst thing in business is where you have a problem, it's identified, it hasn't been brought to the attention of those people who can fix it, and it just festers. Right, and they keep doubling down on the bad decision rather yeah. than yeah. they see it as a sign of weakness. I don't think First you, rule on Wall Street, mm-hmm. cut your losses. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Ignore some costs. I don't think you can be afraid to fail. I, I agree with you. You got to take I chances. With I agree with you. If if you're afraid to fail, you won't make decisions. Right. And right. Right. No doubt. And, and and the last two qualities that the Marines talk about, and I know each of you has them, is knowledge and enthusiasm. If you know your business, like each of you know your business, and you bring enthusiasm, that's infectious. That's infectious. It's just, uh, you know, I, there's a great, great leadership quote I heard. You know, people will forget your words. They'll forget your actions, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And I think that the three of you kind of, you know, bring that to the table as leaders. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to have you here. And uh, before we wrap, though, let's go around the room and make sure everybody's got coordinates and so people can learn more. Uh, Jim, a website? If someone wants to learn uh, more. Very easy. TMCapital.com. Good stuff, Eric. HamiltonInvestmentCouncil.com. Linda? CMA.Consulting. All right. What do you think? Gordy, first one. I loved it. You I lo- loved it. You learn I, they, 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 you learn every day. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just... There's something about being with people who are doing it real time, mm-hmm. who are living it. And, you know, when they leave here, they're going back to leading people and just getting their input and getting their thoughts is, yes, you learn a lot being around people like this. And that's what this show is all about is kind of getting this knowledge out there and sharing the wisdom from the leaders that are making things happen. I agree. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Uh, This is Lee Cantor for Gordy Morse. We will see you all next time on Cutting Edge Leadership. 